Hi, this is your host Sapne Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFR Insight. And today we have with us Dan Wendland, CEO of Isovalent. Dan, first of all, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Swapno. I appreciate it. So Isovalent has kind of emerged from stealth. You have raised a lot of money. I want to get into the history, the story of the company. Tell us what problem are you trying to solve? What is the company all about? Sure. Well, so to start a bit with the background, you know, my co-founder Thomas Graf and I both spent kind of the entirety of our last, last 15 years kind of on the front lines of Linux software-defined networking. You know, Thomas was working upstream in the Linux kernel most of that time at Red Hat. I was one of the first employees at NYSERA, which was the company that built Open vSwitch, drove a lot of the software-defined networking movement. So I think, you know, we were both very involved in this, you know, what I think is one of the most interesting transformations in the infrastructure space, which is the value of networking moving out of boxes and into software. And yet what we saw was that that movement was really fundamentally limited by the capabilities of Linux networking as they've existed. The first wave of Linux networking was really kind of replicating that traditional networking model, right? You had firewalls like IP tables, which matched on IPs and ports so that you could put Linux on a physical box and make it a firewall. Those aren't the same challenges that people are facing today as they're building you know, large complex distributed applications, deploying them on top of Kubernetes Things like IP addresses are entirely meaningless in that world. I can't say, hey, this, you know, this service has this IP address, this one has this IP address. Or if the security team is getting logs for a you know, incident investigation, they, those IP addresses and ports are meaningless in those worlds. So we really saw an opportunity to kind of bring Linux networking and security into a modern era. And that was kind of the fundamental driver. Like as enterprises are adopting Kubernetes, moving to microservices, how does the Linux kernel become aware of Kubernetes identity, service identity, those types of things? Right. Also, it also when you do look at the cloud native environment or Kubernetes world, uh, security is kind of becoming a, a kind of priority, right? You cannot not talk about security and network does play a very, we talk about zero trust network. So uh, can you also talk about, was there a need to kind of reinvent the very established, you know, networking stack that you talk about Linux for, for, for this new word? And uh, if yes, uh, then you did talk about, you know, IP tables and traditional firewalls and tool balance. So they, most of those things do not make sense. So talk about the need to reinvent. And then let's talk about how are you trying to reinvent and where we are in that journey. I think as you pointed out, Kubernetes, you know, I think a lot of enterprises are going through this journey. The first step of Kubernetes was just how do I stand up Kubernetes, you know? Let me take the first workload that doesn't really matter if it breaks and put it on Kubernetes. You know, those types of, that's where a lot of enterprises were. And now what we're seeing is as they move past those inflection points of, oh, I know how to stand up and run Kubernetes. Then it's, oh, I'm moving the important workloads over onto Kubernetes. That's when things like the security, like, you know, those compliance requirements about PCI apps, they still apply when your workloads are running on Kubernetes. Right, the need for the SecOps team to do those incident investigations, those still apply. But the important thing to understand that's really driving this change in the space is that you know, Kubernetes, from a fundamental design perspective, doesn't care about how you traditionally did network security. You know, the, there's a fundamental design choice that IPs are meaningless in a Kubernetes environment. So when you have an entire Linux stack that's built around you know, IPs as that fundamental notion of identity, that doesn't work very well. And so of course you can kind of try to bolt on Kubernetes awareness on top of, a, of you know, a firewall like IP tables. And that works, you know, for certain limited circumstances, but it's inefficient. It's, you know, doesn't have the depth of visibility that most of our customers work. And what's really changed is the availability of this new technology that we co-maintain inside of Linux called eBPF. And that's really what's let us just kind of unshackle um, from those traditional Linux abstractions. 
And since you mentioned EPPF, and which I think is also kind of the foundation of all the solutions and products that you have there. So talk a bit about what kind of adoption or traction do you see of EBPF and what is the tr primary driver behind that adoption uh, and momentum? Yeah, so EBPF itself is a very low level Linux kernel technology. You literally are like programming effectively kernel code in very low level C. Um, so, you know, we've seen for years, you know, you know, for the past three plus years, Facebook has run every packet in and out of their data center through eBPF and Google uses it, Netflix uses it. So it's a very robust, solid technology for injecting additional intelligence into the Linux kernel. But it's been a very low level technology. And so it's not something that's very easy for enterprises to take advantage of. And so if you think about what we're doing is we co-maintain eBPF as a technology upstream in the Linux kernel. We're dealing with all those low level details of eBPF, but we're also building the Cilium project, which is using eBPF as an internal engine to give you deeper security visibility, but not in a way that you even need to know that anything about eBPF to benefit from that security visibility or benefit from those policies. You know, they perform better, they see deeper into the connection, you know, than would be possible with the traditional thing because of eBPF. But you don't need to kind of understand or kind of learn eBPF to benefit from it using Cilium. So I think that's really, I think, the key thing that's making eBPF more accessible is taking eBPF, which is general purpose and low level, and using it to tackle a very specific problem which is networking, observability, and security inside of Kubernetes, and packaging that in a way that gives users high-level abstractions. Like, hey, this service should be able to talk to this service, right? Um, or getting flow data into Splunk or Elk for incident investigations by your troubleshooting team. It's really bridging between the raw power of eBPF and the customer problems. That's kind of the magic, I think, of what we're doing with Cilium. Now, if you look at eBPF, you know, uh, you're not the only one who is leveraging it or offering it. Also, cloud native space or Kubernetes space is a very busy and crowded space. Uh, don't even look at the CNCF <laughs> yeah, landscape. The landscape so talk right? a bit of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so let's talk about number one is that, uh, how do you uh, differentiate yourself in this crowded space while leveraging the same open source technology. Sometimes when you talk to open source company, they don't say, no, we don't need to differentiate ourselves. You know, everybody's solving a specific problem in this space. So talk about uh, how you are kind of differentiating yourself while leveraging these open source technology in this very, very crowded space. Yeah, and just to be, just to be we're not just leveraging eBPF. We are literally still building and improving eBPF in the Linux kernel. And I think that's a really important decision. So when I talk leveraging, there are two, yeah. So I, yeah, I know I, I fully agree with you because what happens is when we talk about, especially in the case of open source, I, I, I kind of call Either you are a user or a consumer. If you're a user, you are very actively engaging with the community. You know, you are giving back. So I put you guys in the user community. When I say leveraging, it's not you are giving back. So for our audience to be very, very clear, we are not talking about somebody who is just taking a project. We are talking about uh, the creator or the, the, the active contributor. So let's get that very, very clear. So, so yes, thanks for bringing it up. But I also want to make it clear that you're not a consumer of the technology and you don't have to do anything with the upstream, as you guys also said earlier. So, so to be very, very clear about no, and I, and I think it's an important distinction because I think eBPF, you know, when we started building Cilium and, and, you know, working with eBPF almost, you know, three plus almost four years ago, no one had heard of it. No one else was talking about it, etc. Nowadays, you know, lots of people, you hear eBPF over here, and I think a failure is to think about eBPF as a checkbox. Like, oh, I have eBPF or I don't have eBPF. And if anything has eBPF, it's kind of all the same. It's not like a feature that you check off. eBPF is fundamentally a programming language, right? And it's about what are the things that you can build with eBPF? How can you use eBPF to build a better firewall, to build better you know, networking between Kubernetes clusters that are in different domains, et cetera. So that's why I think our expertise and leadership in eBPF is so important because it's not simply a matter of like, oh, well, we can use eBPF too, right? It's really about who, who are the people who are able to build the most powerful, you know, problem-solving capabilities with eBPF. 
And that's really, I think, where we shine. And our customers ultimately care about the depth of visibility we give them for instant investigations or the fact that our firewall is more powerful than what someone else could build with IP tables or even what someone else would probably build with eBPF. It's not just about, um, you know, kind of the capabilities of you have eBPF or you don't. It's really about how much expertise do you have around eBPF and what can you build once that kind of power is unlocked. Also, uh, let's go back to the, 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 the discussion that started was that you came out of stealth. You have raised uh, almost $29 million there. So talk a bit about, first of all, what are your immediate you know, plans? How, where are you planning to invest the resources? Are you going to build more technology? I mean, of course, technology is already there. But let's talk about uh, the growth areas that <laughs> uh, you're looking at. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, you know, it is a very heavy technical lift to rebuild the entirety of the Linux kernel networking stack in eBPF. Like, we should be very upfront about that. There's a lot of very deep technology we've built around firewalling, around load balancing, around observability, et cetera. And, you know, getting that solid. And, you know, the reality is we've open sourced, you know, all of that. So from that perspective, I think the number one mission of the company continues to be the absolute best Kubernetes networking observability and security is open source via Cilium. And we believe, you know, adoption of this by people like Google and their GKE offerings, adoption of this by leading enterprises like Adobe and Capital One kind of show that I think the world's recognizing that this is the direction that, that things are going. Um, you know, then the question is, okay, great, you've built the leading open source project in space. How do you build a business on that? As you point out, that's an entirely different challenge. Um, you know, and really the way we look at it is, you know, a, what a Kubernetes team picks us for has to be fully open source. But within a complex enterprise customer, there are different groups that even that Kubernetes team needs to interact with, right? How do they work with the SecOps team? Um, to get you know, flow data into the SecOps team sim? Um, how do they make sure each application team kind of can easily troubleshoot the network connectivity of their apps, right? Some of those enterprise workflows that are about, that are kind of built on top of the core networking security and observability constructs that are in Cilium, that's kind of how, you know, we're, we're kind of extending um, the business model. So obviously, you know, we have a hardened enterprise distro of Cilium, but going beyond there to kind of solve those really higher level enterprise problems, that's where, you know, we've invested from a product perspective. And since we're talking on Linux, and whenever I talk to Linux servers, and, you know, I bring up that people sometimes say, hey, Kubernetes is the Linux of the cloud. And they're like, no, <laughs> Linux is still <laughs> Linux of the cloud because <laughs> all those clouds run on Linux. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and talk about not only the company, but also uh, the, the, the wider ecosystem and also how things are changing in this, you know, software defined networking space, security systems. I would love to talk to you again because I see, you know, uh, a lot of these, you know, uh, startups, that's where the real story, of course, Amazon is there and all those big things, but real stories are here with these companies like, you know, what you are building here. So I would love to talk to you again. So once again, thank you. If we don't talk to each other this year, then uh, uh, happy new year and we'll see you um, hopefully next year. Yeah, sounds good. Stay safe. Happy holidays. Have a good one.